Today's dedication is for Terax who gave me a very generous one year's worth of subscriptions on Patreon. Made two versions of this list. The wildfire combo that everyone's waxing lyrical about and an actual version of the deck so we'll see if we can win with this at all and hopefully if we can it'll be reasonably quick. And in the meantime we need to pray that we don't draw into the wildfire. Alright, seems as though Merin has accidentally passed through the turn. Didn't have a land to make, perhaps? Don't know why you keep an Olander. Uh, and then it's gone round to our turn again. Is that two players that have not kept hands with lands in them? I mean, this isn't going to be a real game anyway if I have my way, so... Get down the second land, ready for the infamous Cruel Claw. Alright, Merrin managing to make a land on turn two. Thought Vessel, good looking Thought Vessel. I didn't know you could get extended artwork in this now. Alright, and again, not... Yeah, he's discarded to hand size there. I don't know what the plan is here. Maybe <laughs> maybe they foresee the world fire thing and just want to get the game over with as soon as possible. So, like I said, it's not actually a real game. We're just hoping to actually show off the combo here. Problem is, I do have a real version of this list, which we will hopefully see after this game in the same video. And everyone's just going to assume that it's a world fire deck. So hopefully we'll be able to play some cards out before the infamous Cruel Claw. You know, like mana rocks and things, so that they'll know it's not a world fire list. Anyway, Collector Oaf into play for the Merrin player. So it's not too likely that our opponents are going to do anything against us here. Because Merrin with black mana could have destroyed the infamous Cruel Claw. And green isn't as likely to get rid of creatures, a Garrix Harbinger. So we're pretty much playing around a Plains and a Source to Plowshares from the five colour player. Who again just passes through the turn, so discarding... Even more Assassin's Creed stuff there, and then just scoops. Okay, whatever. So we've managed to not draw into the world fire, which is really good. Um, not much point getting a land down here, but we'll just do it anyway. So with our Menace, we can get through either player here. If these two players had got down two creatures, I'd be annoyed at the Assassin's Creed player scoop in there, because we wouldn't have had anyone to swing in at and get the combo off. But it's arbitrary, it doesn't matter who we swing in at here. So once we hit, we've only got one spell in the deck. We exile our deck until we hit it, and it was quite close, down to 82 cards in hand. It is the World Fire, exile all permanents, all cards from hands and graveyards. Each player's life total becomes one. Fairly recently unbanned in Commander. And maybe we're about to see why it was banned in the first place. So we all lose all of our cards, throw our Commander in the Command Zone, because we might have to replay it if we... Don't manage to win reasonably quickly. But we're all in top deck mode. It's a race to see who can hit someone first. Maybe the green players will get into a land and then into a mana dork and be able to take us out. But our plan here really is to get into a land that will ping an opponent, a man land, something like that. Um, and have we just got an extra turn? Looks as though Merrin accidentally passed through the turn again. I think he's a new player who keeps accidentally passing through turns. This player scoops. I mean, nothing to say that we're going to win this. And yeah, and then Merrin does it as well. So this is Worldfire combo and don't ever intend on playing it again for these exact reasons. But yeah, getting into a man land there. Uh, that was a 1-1. So could have played that on our next turn or the turn that we were just about to play. Animated it with this on the turn after. We're always going to hit lands because we've got 98 lands in the deck. And then we start cherry picking who we take out with our man lands or our means of pinging our opponents straight away with the lands ETBs. So that is the infamous Cruel Claw Worldfire combo. Let's get a real game in this time. The infamous Cruel Claw versus Miss Bumbleflower, Zarda and Zoraline. Zoraline's proving to be a pretty popular one on Magic Online. I'm amazed to see it as much as I am. I think it's by far the most popular commander from the set that I've seen. Anyway, deciding to keep this one because we've got some ramp in the early game. Hopefully be able to show our opponents that it's not a world fire list, like I said. So, do we go for Rakdos Signet on turn one? Uh, yeah, I think that's fine. Need to be careful with how much life we're taking at turn one. Ancient Tomb is um, always pretty risky. On a semi-regular basis, depending on how well my decks do in a video. Ancient Tomb is always considered this CEDH card that just absolutely breaks the game and 
very much upsets certain viewers of the channel, so hopefully we don't get too much crying over a Turn 1 Ancient Tomb. An expedition map on Turn 1 for Zoraline, able to search for any land. And a Turn 1 Sol Ring for the Miss Bumbleflower, got down a Taps of Ale land and kept the card on top previously. Into an Arcane Signet, so no one's allowed to complain about my Ancient Tomb now, alright? Drawing to a Trumpeting Carnosaur, the idea with this version of the list is that we just get free big spells into play. We can actually stack the top of our library with something like a Vamp Tutor. So uh, straight away we'll go for the infamous Cruel Claw. And we're obviously going to draw into whatever we get with the Vamp Tutor. So let's take advantage of being able to throw down a tap land here. And we can do the Vamp Tutor thing during our next main phase. Assuming that we're going to be able to land with the infamous Cruel Claw, we'll probably wait for the ability to go on the stack first. Expedition map being cracked. I've just noticed in the chat that the um, Zada player is asking us to play a red land, so maybe he has Felwar Stone here or something. Uh, the land tutored for is a Maze of Ith for the Orzhov player, who does not have any white mana yet. And yeah, there it is, a Felwar Stone, so... Eager to be able to tap this for mana as well. Red mana specifically, so I'm not sure what one mana red spell he would want to play there. Maybe he wants a lightning bolt onto this. And the second commander, Miss Bumbleflower, down on turn three. I'm just hoping that we don't see any white mana being held up for a sword or something. There's a tundra. Would very much like our opponent to tap out. Alright, a search for as counter, so. What do we want to cheat into play? We've got three Eldrazi in the list. I don't think I really want to have my opponent scoop to that straight away, although dealing with Miss Bumbleflower is probably going to be an intelligent idea. Do we just play it in a completely degenerate manner and go for Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger? Draw into another land. So let's go straight through to attacks. We'll swing at... Yeah, Miss Bumbleflower. We do have Menace. And no blocks made here, so I am holding priority. Luckily it works this time. Sometimes it doesn't work on Magic Online. So with Infamous on the stack, I just want to see, actually. Did I ask for any kind of power level in the lobby here? Oh, I did ask for power level 7. Alright, so in honour of that, I'm not going to go for the totally degenerate play here, then. Otherwise, it would have been Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger and probably blow up the Sol Ring and the Miss Bumbleflower. Um, what do we want instead? Could just go for Archon of Cruelty to deal with the commander. That's a bit more fair, isn't it? So, throw that on top. The infamous triggers and obviously seize the first card. Uh, so we have to discard here. Let's just throw away a mountain. So Miss Bumbleflower being forced to sacrifice. Discard a card and lose three life. So yeah, this is more like power level... 8 type stuff I think, it's not CEDH as far as I'm concerned, but but we are going pretty hard here. Um, so I've only got 3 mana, can't equip the uh, Whisper Silk Cloak unfortunately, but we might as well play it here I suppose. So we're challenging our opponents to basically have some um, means of interaction onto the infamous Cruel Claw. In worst case scenario we've got the Whisper Silk Cloak to throw on this instead. Okay, there's a dam being used as targeted removal onto the Archon of Cruelty, that's fine. Get to keep our commander at least. So the question is next turn, do we go for the Trumpeting Carnosaur? Or do we equip up the infamous Cruel Claw? Purposely not played any mountains into this Felwar Stone if our opponent's so eager for us to have some red mana for that. Not going to play around it too much though, we'll get down the Shock Climb next turn. Beetleback Chief is going to generate some tokens. Obviously a good one for Zarda to see. It might be that it's Goblin Tribal. The Maze of Ith has entered as well, so... Just gonna try and buy himself time with that, and... This is where Whisper Silk Cloak comes in handy. Four cards in Miss Bumbleflower's hand. I think he just used the uh, Search for Ascanta to throw away the basic, so... Does he have any spot removal for us? This is the problem. I like to, with equipment, I like to play and equip them straight away. Because then your opponents can't play in a reactionary manner holding up, you know, their colours and stuff. Or they're less likely to, anyway. But we weren't doing anything last turn, so now holding up 3, 4, 5, 6 mana. Would have only been 4 if we'd gone for that Eldrazi play. A Raucous Theatre. I think my opponent is holding up some kind of spot removal, so... 
Yeah, I'm instead going to go for the Trumpeting Carnosaur, I think. And then if they've got a counter for the Trumpeting Carnosaur, then so be it. And Miss Bumbleflower is holding up priority. You do cast with the infamous Cruel Claw, which is noteworthy, so you do get, like, cast triggers and things like that. And it does mean that your opponents can go for counter magic onto whatever you cascade into. So there is a C double. This spell can't be copied. Copy a target spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. Eh, keeps things interesting. So gets a trumpeting carnosaur of his own. think all three of our opponents are looking in our direction, but should be concentrating on both Infamous Cruel Claw and Miss Bumbleflower. I don't think Miss Bumbleflower yet gets the respect she deserves, but this is a very good commander, as we saw in a previous um, in a previous game in which we played her. Tempt with Discovery. Do we have any decent lands that we want to take? I mean, the answer is always to say no to this, but Zoraline might fix white mana. We do have Cabal Coffers in the list. Eh, it makes the Bumbleflower more of a threat than us if we give him a bunch of lands. So let's go Tempt with Discovery. I'll say yes to it. But 90% of the time you say no to this and pretty much all tempting offers. I have a feeling that my opponents are going to say yes to it though and don't want to be left too far behind. Also, if we can grab ourselves an Urborg ready to get into the Cabal Coffers, means we're not taking a bunch of life to Ancient Tomb because we're down to 31 already. It's not worthy that the land does come into play untapped with Tempt with Discovery, so if we didn't have the Ancient Tomb or we had, you know, the ever-hated land, Temple of the False God in the list or something like that, then we could actually have afforded the Whisper Silk Cloak here. But maybe we'll get into some more mana with the Trumpeting Carnosaur. We do get a Discover right, into a Promise of Power. So just go for the card draw on that, I think. We could pay the Entwine cost if we had the additional mana held up, which is noteworthy. It's just the initial cost that we don't pay. Uh, so yeah, five cards, five life. Lose even more. But like I said, we might draw into more mana here so that we can get the Whisper Silk Cloak equipped. We do not, unfortunately. So let's play around the fact that the Maze of Ith is not going to... Yeah, he is holding up priority. Sometimes players F6 through the turn and forget all about the Maze of Ith. Obviously Zoraline is being vigilant here and expecting us to swing in. So we'll try it. Can untap any attacking creature. So does do that. Always have to force the issue. And we'll just discard... Yeah, I don't think I care about having another tap land, so we'll get rid of the Surveil land here. Might be time for a Massacre Worm next turn, depending on what our opponents do. Zoraline tends to have a lot of Soul Sisters and cheap creatures, so maybe save it for that. And Savine's Reclamation, grabbing back the Expedition map. So I might have a Cabal Coffers of his own now that we've tutored out the Urborg. Not whether he did use the mana to tap down his Maze of Ith. Goblin Crater Maker, 2 damage to a target creature, and that's another thing that can get wrapped up with the Masker Worm. Uh, blows up the Whisper Silk Cloak, more importantly, with this thing. Can destroy a colourless non-land permanent. And then ironically gets an equipment out of his own in Lightning Greaves. In response to that, each player draws a card with Makokoro. And gets us into Reanimate, which is good for our Infamous. Don't want to be taking even more life. I'm not sure how much life gains in this deck, actually. Might have gone... A little bit too idle on this one. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word on YouTube, actually. <laughs> a single goblin token, putting the fear of God in Zoraline. And the third surveil land for the Miss Bumbleflower player. Throws away Leyland of Anticipation. What have you got in your hand if you don't want Leyland of Anticipation? As Canter, turning into the land version. So look at the top four cards for three mana and a tap. Reveal a non-creature on land, put it into your hand. Throws out a Cultivate, four cards in hand. Tidal Barracuda after that. Any player may play spells at flash speed, but can't do anything on your turn. So that's going to make things a lot more interesting. Not suppose there's any real need to do much of anything other than drop a land here in that case. So we'll just throw out the Tainted Peak. Oh, and swinging in with the infamous Cruel Claw makes sense as well, so we'll do that here. Seems as though no one has any spot removal, which is good. So infamous Cruel Claw able to hit our opponent. Gets us into Insatiable Avarice. So we do have to pay the spree cost on this. This is a bit of a nombo. Um, yeah, we'll just go for the three mana tutor, I think. Discard a land in order to play that. Does mean that we're not going to be able to cheat something with the infamous Cruel Claw, but we'll be able to sort out our next turn. Maybe just go for Cabal Coffers here. Where is it? 
Yeah, cabal coffers, so that we've got a lot of mana to hard cast all this big expensive stuff that we're getting into. Could have gone for some kind of evasion on the infamous cruel claw there as well. Um, but yeah, we've got three, four, five, six mana held up, so that can be an instant speed reanimate. It could be massacre worm to deal with all this mess. Expedition map being cracked, and does grab himself that cabal coffers as we thought he would. Not worthy, he does tap down his white mana into that in order to hold up the Maze of Ith. And Dark Star Augur. At the beginning of your upkeep, reveal the top card of your library. You can put it into your hand and lose life equal to the mana value. So, yeah, I didn't realise that I haven't looked at all the bats in the recent set. I'm just used to bats being terrible, but apparently they're pushing them as a tribe now. Because that is a Dark Confident that's pretty good. Uh, and Entomb in response to that. Throws any card into the bin. You would assume it would be something that you can reanimate with Zoraline. Might have been tempted to pay the offspring cost on this personally. I mean it's twice as much hurt. But you assume that his deck peaks at 3 mana. Maybe even 2 mana. So probably won't lose that much life to it. Oh he did pay the offspring cost. Okay so does get a copy of it. And the token copy art is different than the original. Which is cool. A big score. Discard draw 2. Make 2 treasure. Discarded a Cold Steel Heart to that, 5 cards in hand, and 4 mana available. And there's a Dragon Fodder, the Massacre Worm is really going to hurt that player. Skirk Prospector to generate lots of mana as well. So down comes Zarda after that, we'll see if he can target his creatures with anything interesting. And it's Renegade Tactics targeting his commander, so can't block this turn but does draw a card. And that will be copied across his two other creatures to refill his hand. So obviously could have gone for the Massacre Worm in response to Zarda coming down. But it's a fine balancing act between keeping your opponents as at least a little bit of a threat and making yourself an all-out threat so that it's a three-on-one. When we're swallowing up so much of our own life total, it's a risky thing. And we need to make sure that our opponents are somewhat looking at each other, which I don't think they are at the moment as it happens. Oh, and the Lightning Greaves is a nombo there as well. He couldn't legally target the Beetlebat Chief, so only got one copy of the Renegade Tactics. Shroud switched off his combo there. Or mini combo, for lack of a better term. So we will not be able to do anything during this player's turn, thanks to the Tidal Barracuda. And I'm thinking of being absolutely reckless, even more than we already have been, and reanimating the Archon of Cruelty. That is an ETB, so we'll be able to point that over here. This player doing something in response. Makokoro? Nope, it is Jace Bellerin. Uh, can't activate that at instant speed, so... Yeah, let's go for the reanimate then. And we can hold this up to put a shadow counter onto our commander if we like. So let's go for instant speed reanimate onto the Archon of Cruelty. We'll gain a little bit of life when it enters at least. Point this at our opponent and can either sacrifice the Trumpeting Carnosaur or the Barracuda. I'm fine with either or, but I'd rather the Barracuda goes down. Likely going to keep that in play though. And yep, gets rid of the token. Force him to discard a Cyclonic Rift as well, which means he's got one card in hand that he really likes. And we're probably going to see that next turn. Each player draws a card with Jace Bellerin ticking down. Gets us into a land. Just more fodder for us to discard to our commander. Now, next turn, it's not likely we're going to be able to get through the Maze of Ith, but they can only tap this once. If we can get an extra combat step with Morog, then that would pan out quite nicely for us. Could get a couple, thanks to the fetch we just drew into. This Bumbleflower into play for the second time. I was removing it that early on, really held that back for the majority of the game here. So, two cards in hand, we'll see if he can play two instants. Alright, draw into another fetch. We can't make multiple lands in a Rakdos deck, unfortunately. Otherwise, Morog would be even better. Oh, damn it, I forgot to put the Shadow Counter on here as well. Oh, that's so annoying. <laughs> uh, I had it in my head that we couldn't do anything because of this, but of course we can activate abilities. I just said that. Okay, well, we can swing in over here, and they have to sacrifice a creature so we can get through with the Menace anyway. Um, then we can play Morog afterwards. And we want to play the lands during the second main anyhow with this. So, yeah, just go straight through to combat. Miss Bumbleflower continuing to hold up priority. Alright, a perch protection. 
And the Zoroline uh, player is going to get an extra turn after this one. Put this in my bird tribal list, I've got high hopes for it. That is only the first spell being cast with Miss Bumbleflower, so... Uh, target opponent draws a card, which is also going at Zoroline. Plus counter goes on to the Tidal Barracuda. But this does phase out Miss Bumbleflower now. Which also phases out the Barracuda, so we can't do the instant speed stuff. Luckily we weren't going to attack the Bamp player anyway. So swing into the left with both of these so that we can get through with Menace because the Archon of Cruelty triggers on attacks as well. We can target any player, not just the player we're attacking, but maybe try and spread the damage around a little bit or do we just pile in all at one player, try and get rid of that Maze of Ith. So there we go, Maze of Ith is going to remove that creature. Archon of Cruelty resolves. They have to discard, sacrifice and lose life. So discarding the original because it's easy enough to reanimate it with their commander. And also discarding a nesting grounds in order to move the finality counters around. It's an interesting thing you can do with finality counters. Put them on your opponent's stuff and then they get exiled. Drew into another fetch. So as much as I want to get down Cabal Coffers here, I think we're pretty much tapping out anyway. So throw out the Morogue on our second main phase and I don't know if there's much point in holding up three mana during our opponent's turn but might draw into some kind of spot removal or something off the Archon so we will put life into the Ancient Tomb again been a pretty aggressive game so we'll continue to play aggressively so now we play Wooded Foothills oh and this is whenever it deals damage to a player so how is this worded then? prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to and by that creature this turn. Oh, so it does actually switch off our commander. I thought it was just for the end of combat, but apparently not. Anyway, we get the Morog into play. Play the fetch into it. So I suppose I might as well have swung in with the Trumpeting Carnosaur as well. Can do that now. So untap all the creatures. And we'll just continue in over here. So yeah, if we lose out by 7 points of damage, then we can just add it to the list of mistakes this game. Swing in at Zoroline with everything, trigger the Archon again pointed at this player because I'm just trying to bully Zoroline and Maze of Ith out of the game at this point. And we draw into Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger, which we will probably be able to get down with Cabal Coffers next turn. We do get buffs on our creatures here and we're going to get in another attack, so don't think we're going to be punished for not attacking in with the Trumpeting Carnosaur previously, thankfully. Yeah, they're down to six. So then we crack the Wooded Foothills. And that can just be a basic mountain, just in case basics matter at some point. Or does this only trigger once a turn? Why are we in the end step? Alright, no idea what happened there. I'm sure I was in the main phase when I just cracked that. What a train wreck. So, this player should have gone down there. Not only to the first attack on the Trumpeting Carnosaur, we should have been able to take both of these in at our opponent there. Um, yeah, and that would have been more damage here and... Had them discard more and sacrifice and all that type of thing. And we're giving this player another turn as well. Which could make all the difference here. Savine's Reclamation onto the Navigation Orb. Search your library for two basics. One onto the battlefield, one into your hand. And cast it with flashback so it gets another one as well. So targets the Expedition map again. Cracks the map. And is tapping down his mana into the navigation orb, including on the Maze of Ith, so he's just assuming that he's going to go down anyway. Oh, of course he's got the extra turn, hasn't he? That's why he was willing to tap this down. And I'm assuming the other players aren't going to try and get rid of Zoroline because they want us to focus in on him and his Maze of Ith. So I'm assuming they're going to leave him in play. Eight mana generated from Cabal Coffers. Seven cards in hand. Guy reach Sanitarium draw and discard. Amazingly, still haven't seen any spot removal onto the infamous Cruel Claw. I uh, could discard blood for the Blood God here, but if there's some kind of wrath at some point, then maybe it'll be worth playing that in order to get rid of this player. Um, yeah, I'll get rid of a fetch against my better judgement. Cast a Signing Blood going down to three. Oh, that's what I'm misremembering with Morog. Yeah, you don't get an additional main phase, do you? Yeah, I'm sure you've all commented on it by now, but <laughs> yeah. I always think that there's something I need to remember with Morog, and apparently I always forget. Yeah, you can't chain off extra combats with Landfall. Um, anyway, that player goes down regardless, so it's pretty much the same outcome. Yeah, I was sure I saw it stop on the main phase, but 
that must have just been for a split second as the client was lagging because we didn't get an additional main phase a goblin rally is four goblin tokens so are they going to sack any of these to the skirk prospector i'm just still thinking about this massacre worm especially with the bird tokens that are in play now probably have to play the massacre worm next turn oh we could go for the portal to phyrexia i suppose Anyway, Lightning Greaves being thrown onto the token instead, probably thinking of the Nombo. Maybe there's some kind of overrun effect that you can do with all these tokens now. A Titan Strength, yeah, plus three, plus one, and Scry one. They're only going on these three creatures at least. Well, they go on these creatures as well. He does get the additional Scry, but does not have any means of haste, like I said. Could have the... what is it called? There's a single red enchantment. Pandemonium? No, it's not Pandemonium. It's something like that, though. Single red enchantment gives everything haste. So he could have that. Can still block the Beetlebat Chief, which is a decent chunk of damage, though. Might have another means of doing something like that. In which case, we'll just have to chump. A Fist of Flame. Plus one to power for each card you've drawn this turn. And you do draw a card with this as well. So getting multiple copies of it is multiple buffs. And the Lightning Greaves will obviously be able to move on to one of these also, so that's even more damage onto us. Will they be able to one-shot us? They've got 9 power here, 12 on the Commander, that does have Trample. Oh, they've all got Trample, 7-12, or a 7-2 even, a 7-3. And now they've got 7 cards in hand, so this is where Zarda starts to go off. Yeah, so me misremembering the Morog, thinking that we'd be able to get another attack in over here. I don't know if it really made a difference. I wanted to get rid of that player regardless. We were just kind of gambling, not going for the Massacre Worm before now. But I felt the need to control the other two players as opposed to the Zarda player, who obviously can go off out of nowhere. We're up against three good opponents, so, you know, what do you do? Accelerate is haste on everything and draw a card. So it's a 7-3, a 7-2, a 12-4 and an 8-2. So they can probably get pretty close to taking us out in fact if they turn everything in sideways they probably can take us out here so do we go blood for the blood god on the way out i wouldn't have thought eight creatures have died here have they there's only one player he can attack here so turns everything in sideways at us and yeah there's only a few creatures have died we'd have to wheel our hand anyway so it didn't matter that i missed the shadow counter in the end and all this playing it right into the hand of the group hug player in typical group hug player fashion the either this is the type of group hug the way that you should play it is having your opponents all fight it out against each other while you continue to accrue a massive board a lot of group hug players tend to just hand the win over to an opponent and do absolutely nothing themselves but this player is doing it in the correct way in my opinion He's establishing his own board to sweep in the victory while the other three players all take each other out then he can just sweep up at the end only got one card in hand though so if he can double spell here he'll be able to draw another couple he's got plenty of mana means of putting another spell into his hand with this as well but zerda was taken down by our creature and while he's got nine cards in hand he does need his commander available to him so each player draws a card with the jace again oh it's by I said it was ticking down previously. It's by ticking up with Jace Bellerin. So up to 7 loyalty. And the minus on that is mil 20. It's not really relevant in Commander. Words of Wisdom has ended up in the bin as well. Then each player draws 2 cards. So that is the first time triggering the Miss Bumble Flower. Puts the counter onto the Commander. It's a perfect scenario for the Bant player. Because there's not a whole lot of mana being generated by Zarda. So you can give him all the cards he wants. But if he can't cast them all then doesn't necessarily matter although Zarda as we saw before does have a lot of small cantrip spells but we assume he had a bunch of those in hand anyway so a horn of greed yeah, not really the best card that he could have played there in order to further himself to victory Miss Bumbleflower triggers for the second time so draws two additional cards another plus counter on the commander plays a land into horn of greed to draw and now going through to combat doesn't feel as though he wants to play any more spells to buff his army so Vigilance 3-7 and a bunch of 2-2 two, two flyers. And it's over to Zarda's turn again now with 15 cards in hand and no commander. Draws again to the Horn of Greed. More goblins in Krenko's command. 
Goblin Warchief gives them haste and discounts the goblins. Still can't afford his commander though. So didn't draw himself into Mana Crypt or anything like that apparently. So instead has to sacrifice some of his goblins in order to be able to afford the Zarda. So 28 damage here, 5 cards in hand. He'll need to get 28 damage off. But yeah, doesn't have enough creatures to be able to rely on the Skirt Prospector. And our opponent had a Settle the Wreckage anyway, so was never going to be able to get through the Group Hug player. So that's how you build Miss Bumbleflower, or one of the means in which you build it anyway. Just have all your opponents blow each other up and then swoop in for the victory at the end. Some sequencing errors here and there, but got to see some interesting builds with the infamous Cruel Claw though. You just basically want to keep attacking in and hitting your opponents and getting free spells all over the place. And if you can stack the top cards of your library, then all the better. Don't think I have any Double Strike or anything like that in the list. I can't remember now I built the list that long ago, but Double Strike, Evasion, that type of thing would be good. Anyway, hopefully you all enjoyed these lists. The deck lists are in the description, right next to the Patreon link. If you want to support on there financially, then I'd be very grateful to you, and am very grateful to those of you who are supporting already. I'm Tribal Kai. Thank you for watching.